Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of The Search. So today um, I've been asked to talk about a topic that, that I thought was pretty easy and um, I received an email where I was asked what PP is in terms of what strategies would I recommend uh, to uh, implement it and um, you know, I, this is basically a carbon copy of a lecture that I was asked to give uh, about it initially um, at a uh, webinar. Um, and it was part of a crash course that, that we were doing so that people get refreshed on basic concepts of critical care and things like that. And I'll gladly give it again and again and again because it's the right thing to do given the circumstances. So I figured that today I'll talk about personal protective equipment for about 10 minutes and maybe five minutes on how to implement it in a way that doesn't force people to do it, but persuades them towards that direction using this information. So in the interest of full disclosure, um, you know, these things remain theoretical until you figure out the right and the wrong. And a lot of it is based on current recommendations from all over the world. Um, from the WHO, ANZAC's uh, Department of Health and Social Care in the UK, and the CDC, and all of their recommendations mirror each other, effectively, more or less. Now, I will be talking about some of the exceptions, but more or less. So we're going to go through when to use PPE, what PPE is necessary, how to probably don, use, and doff PPE, and how to probably dispose and disinfect afterwards, and the limitations of PPE. If you cover these things, you're covering the CDC minimum recommendations for the training requirements for personal protective equipment in terms of the corona guidelines. So let's talk about when. It's any case where there's a potential of getting infected, getting other people infected, or putting your coworkers at risk. So whenever you're dealing with a pandemic type of situation, and I'm really trying not to use that word too much, but it looks like we're there already, folks. Whenever you're dealing with a pandemic situation, you, you, the interests of the patient and the interests or the potential risk to your workers and the potential risk to other patients are all on the same line. And I've said that before a couple of episodes ago when talking about how to prepare your ICU, but I would say they're all on the same line. And you should use PPE as one of those strategies that, you, that, that needs to be used. So. Pre-corona, we used to have this hierarchy of controls. It was felt extremely strongly that whenever you identified a hazard, whether it's infective, radiation, etc., your most effective form of control is elimination, not using it at all. Second most effective substitution, then engineering controls, administrative controls, then personal protective gear. Let me get something very clear here. All of this data comes from human factor studies, which are extremely efficient at human factor-based problems. And they were all done pre-corona. Corona is not a human factor-based problem. Corona is an infectious disease problem. And I don't know about you, but I'm the type of acute care specialist who's not extremely adept at these types of situations. But what comes to mind is what my risks are. So when I'm trying to think why should I wear full protective gear? Why do I need to be this thorough? Why not just wear the face shield or the mask or the mask and the face shield? Why the N95 mask? Does it make sense? What's the gown there for? I mean, you know, you need to recognize when looking at Corona specifically, personal protective equipment saves lives. And by personal protective equipment, I mean both persons involved in this transaction, this clinical encounter, let's say. The patient needs to wear a mask for source control, gloves if they can, and if you can afford it in your institution. And if you're not wearing anything, the current recommendations are if you're in contact with a patient who's just wearing a mask and tests corona positive, you go into isolation as well. And it's active isolation for 14 days from your last exposure. If you are wearing full protective gear, but not wearing a mask or a respirator, so just the face shield, the recommendation right now is 14 days of active isolation. If you're not wearing eye protection, but you're wearing the respirator, the gloves and the gown, and the face, and 
the uh, foot wear or foot covers, shoe covers, it's self-delegated supervision, right? With no work restrictions. If you're not wearing the gown or gloves, none. So long as you've got the respirator on and the face shield on. But you are at a slight risk. It has been reported before, only recent as Italy. Two emergency doctors tested positive for corona and had to be admitted to the hospital. It's a big deal, right? And these were doctors who were wearing the N95 masks and the face shields. So that's why I'm kind of on the fence on that one. I think it might change soon. And these are the days. These were, I think, March 18th, I want to say, 18th, 20th. If you're wearing all recommended gear during the encounter and you're not wearing a face mask, your risk is there, but it's also fairly low. So recognize this. The patient needs to wear a mask, and even then, if you're not careful, you're not only putting your lives at risk, but you're weakening the workforce in general. You're weakening your own army. Okay? So if you're not doing your part and you get corona, it's not about you getting corona. It's about you getting corona and being put out of commission. Even if you're not one of the physicians involved in the care of corona patients, you're just there to assess a single problem. Let's just say, hypothetically, hemorrhoids, a bed sore, diabetic foot, and you don't recognize the need for full personal protective equipment and ensuring that your patient wears a mask and you're not wearing the N95 and you're not doing the right thing, you're a surgeon who's now out of commission. You can't treat any of your other patients. You're weakening the army here, okay? You shouldn't be thinking about yourself, you should be thinking about others. And to be honest, same goes for patients. Patients who show up and they're not wearing masks, listen, if the patient refuses the mask, I don't think that it's right ethically because they're putting you at risk. Just from them not wearing a mask, even people who are wearing everything but the eye protection need to go into active uh, isolation. These are the current recommendations. I'm not making this up, guys. Okay? So if your higher-ups aren't giving out masks to patients because they're worried about shortages, explain this to them, that they're going to weaken their work workforce. Then in six weeks' time, the people who aren't involved in the corona team or the corona segregated service or the corona service, etc., will land in isolation and some of them will get infected because these are cdc recommendations i would think that i would follow them personally but that's just the way i feel about the whole situation so what constitutes personal protective equipment so depending on what you read a respirator versus a face mask more and more respirators are in there right eye protection gloves gowns and footwear the respirators they are allowed to wear include N95 masks, surgical N95s, and anything above. Okay? All of these masks need to be fitted. I myself have had to shave. Um, I look like an eight-year-old at this point. And, you know, it's not funny. Whenever you're trying to compare masks to respirators, you have to understand the technology and manufacturing process is extremely similar. But there's a couple of differences. Respirators have to be fit to your face except for PAPR units, which I'll talk about in a sec. Okay. Masks don't. Respirators have been studied in such that they do not allow microparticles to go in. Masks have not been studied for that purpose in particular and only splash proof. Respirators look aesthetically different in that they contain a Neusch name and block letters, a N9, an N or a P code, a lot number and a model number printed on the front. Respirators come in a variety of shapes and sizes. They all work well, so long as you follow N95 and above, or equivalent. Okay, These are the ones that are recommended to the Ministry of Health in Singapore. Um, they recommend them based on the Micron Index, which is a more European number than the N, than the N or the P Index. When you're talking about the fit test, the key points of the fit test is not does it look good, nor if it's tight enough or not. For the fit test to work, it has to fit snugly over your face when you correctly press down on the nose part. Go above and below your ears, not crossed over the ears like a traditional mask, surgeons. 
and it has to fit snugly over your face such that there are no gaps where the air can come through. So you breathe in and out deeply and you feel for any gaps at the edge or the interface between your face, your cheek, and the actual mask. The respirator should also be able to capture all the particles through the filter itself and not under it. Okay, so I see people with their nose sticking out, I see people with their jawline sticking out, and it's just not the right thing. It's a waste of money, really, okay? Now, there's an area of controversy here because based on local and regional situational analysis of personal protective supplies, face masks are considered an acceptable alternative when the supply chain of respirators cannot be met. It cannot meet the demand. During this time, the available respirators should be prioritized for procedures and generate aerosols with the highest exposure risk. Face masks protect the wearer from splashes and sprays. Respirators filter microparticles. This is the current CDC recommendation for when you do not have a supply that equals your demand. Now, this is when your administrative structure needs to start helping you as the physician involved. They need to make sure that they have the supply that you need to meet your demand. Okay? So you need to start pressuring them today, right now, that you are not putting your, your workers at risk and that the face masks will be in. If they're not, you need to recognize that there is a real possibility. It's not a huge possibility, but there's a real possibility that somebody might be laid off at work or somebody might not be able to come in or somebody might be on active isolation because these guidelines are changing on a daily basis. A quick talk about PAPRs. They're the only type of respirator that does not have to be fitted. And all it is is think of it as a negative isolation room that's mobile. Now, the key advantage is it doesn't have to be fitted. It fits all across your face. And in fact, the recommendations right now out of China and certain European countries is to wear these for intubation and surgical procedures as well. Okay? Here's the thing about PAPRs, though. Although they do not require fit testing, they do require a cleaning process, which means that you're going to need to have a supply maintained with their batteries maintained for the whole time. Okay? Donning and doffing, whenever you're wearing it, so... For surgeons, this is a bit easier. The only difference is that you wear the gown before you wear your mask and headgear. So you start off with your gown, then mask and headgear, which is typically your goggles and face shield, and finally the gloves. You should keep away from your hands the minute the gloves are on. You should limit the surfaces that you touch and only touch the areas that you need to get shut, that you need to touch. You should change your gloves whenever they're torn, whenever you think that you've done something gunky, like take a sample or something. And you should perform hygiene between glove changes, i.e. hand hygiene. Whenever you're taking it off, uh, there's a recommendation that you take off the gloves first, and then the goggles and face shield, and then the gown, and then wash your hands afterwards. And deal with the respirator, then wash your hands a second time. There is another recommendation that you do it surgical style, which is every surgeon's done this after a long operation. You rip off the back of the gown and you take the gown and gloves on block, get rid of them, put them down, wash your hands, get rid of the headgear, the face gear, wash your hands a second time, okay? Uh, we've had people who like to use alcohol. We've had people who like to use, uh, you know, hand washing with uh, Hydrex or Cydex or, that type of thing, um, teach his own. I just make sure that you wash your hands, make sure that you use some sort of detergent, okay? The next part of personal protective equipment that isn't very well covered in the guidelines, but I've noticed is an issue, is how you take your samples. So recognize, when you take your samples, it's an invasive procedure. And you're collecting about one to two cc's whenever you're doing an MPA. That's one to two cc's of bodily fluid right there, right? with the risks entailed, okay? And with the amount of panic that's happening all around the world right now, patients aren't gonna be very happy. There's gonna be a short fuse situation, right? Patients aren't gonna be very happy. And you're going to have to be cognizant of that. So you might cough in your face, etc., which increases the number of CCs that are exchanged. So I'd contend after every swab taken, you might wanna redo your personal protective equipment. Listen. I know it could be a waste of resources, but the guidelines say that if they're soiled, you need to change. 
And we just talked about how risky this stuff is, right? And it's not risky towards you. Your mortality as a 35-year-old marathon runner, uh, surgical resident, um, emergency doctor who uh, bikes to and from work on a daily basis, lives a perfectly healthy vegan lifestyle, your mortality is not the issue here. I think that we're all going to be fine as medical practitioners. There may be a point where we all turn COVID positive if we're all involved in the treatment of these patients. I'm talking about you being out of commission while we have a shortage of physicians, doctors, physician assistants, and nurses. That's what I'm worried about. I'm worried about radiology technicians being out of service when we run out of swabs and the only way to diagnose this is to do a CT scan. That's what I'm worried about. Okay, For the most part, we're going to get through this. But we have to be intelligent and we have to be cognizant and we have to be passionate and we have to be on board. Just like any other mass casualty event. Whenever you're doing a bronchoalveolar lavage, it usually involves a bronchoscopy, more often than not. Sometimes it involves a swish and swallow sort of type of situation where they cough up. If these things do happen, there's also a couple of cc's here and there that could fly around. Be cognizant of that. And you might want to change your personal protective equipment afterwards. I've already started to see this creep up on forums and things. Um, I think it'll be around here locally in Kuwait soon. Um, it's an IgG IgM rapid test. It's about 95% sensitive uh, from what they're saying on the packet. Um, I think, yeah, this is probably going to be the future. You know, I've been reading in the press that, that they're looking for a uh, pregnancy test slash sort of convenient packet type of test uh, type of situation. And this could be it. But you need to recognize that in this particular test, the whole mechanism is disposable and contains the patient's blood. So you have to dispose of it in the correct manner and have a sin bin available to you, those yellow boxes. Okay. You should limit the number of people involved in the daily assessments, limit the exposure time, limit the manipulation instrumentation, and use a bare minimum resource footprint, and only go in and out once if you can. Now, if you've worked in hospitals for a while, you understand that there's a culture to every hospital. If you've worked in multiple hospitals, you know, at least from what I've seen, and I've worked on a few, in a few over the past couple of years, you recognize that Every hospital has their own language, their own culture, their own sense of priority, sense of pride, their own identity as a collective group, right? You don't see it as much with the residents. Like the residents think that, that, that or uh, I, I hate talking down to people, but you know what I mean. At resident level, you seem to think that, that you're the pulse of the hospital, and you are. But a lot of your training and a lot of your cultural training how to run things, how to discuss things, how to communicate effectively, how to develop leadership skills, will be based on what you glean from the hospital's culture. And culture is an extremely difficult thing to change. And so one of the things that I was asked was, how do you influence change management? And, you know, rather than reinvent the wheel, I went on Reddit and asked around. First things first, you need to develop a drilling system with passionate people who know this stuff and want to do it. Don't make your, your corona team be um, the guys that kind of, you know, are on rotation or on training. or on. They have to be dedicated staff that want to do this. They have to be voluntold to do it in a weird way. I, you give them the right to volunteer, but you also kind of hint at your A-team that you need one or two of them for training purposes mainly. Right? And then they're involved with you as the administrative arm of things. right? And they can influence change management better because they're your A-team. These are your aces. right? This is like your championship level nurse that, that not only gets the lines in, but gets the patient in on time, gets the CTs done on time, runs around like crazy, man. This is like your um, R3 and she's like born ready and like Forget it. You've got a code trauma. She's down there before the trauma team are down there. First chest tubes in like nothing, man. The surgical residents learn how to do this stuff from her. You want like your best intubation guy. Like literally, if you're looking for fellows, this guy's not even a fellow anymore. It's just a technicality at this point, right? You want that guy on board. 
because these are the guys at resident level that will influence change management for you. And then you want the attendings that mirror those guys and that those guys learned from to be invested with you and champion this, okay? Because we're in it for the long haul. From what I'm hearing, this is going to be at least a one-month process. Probably three to four months, let's be honest, okay? You need to get them involved in drilling and understanding and building the sense of urgency, similar to what we talked about today, right? And then they need to do it again and again and again, either once a day or once a shift. I'll leave it up to you. I would say once a shift is overkill, unless you're in like a thousands of patient situation. I would say start with once a day and move on to once a shift when you've had an economy of numbers, when, when it's become a scalable problem, right? And develop a reporting system for patients who cross-infect and for people who don't adhere to the guidelines. Don't make yourself a bunch of spies. Don't do that, please. But make people be socially responsible around the hospital, okay? So in summary, fit test early, practice, 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 and limit the number of people involved, at least in the beginning. Stay safe, and remember, if you're doing acute care, this is what you live for. This is literally what we do every day, right? Have a good day. Uh, thank you for listening, and please subscribe.